when it came to how Jin was going to join the crew, I knew it just had to be something obviously very personal and related to his character that he would want to, you know, end up staying with the crew and not just him being there for his sister. Um, when it, that's the same way that I think Laguna will be. Like, Laguna's going to have to have some form of very important character piece to his story that ends up tying him to the main cast. I, I, I don't really see him sticking around if he doesn't have something like that coming up, but we'll see. And not the same method, but a similar manner, I believe, was going to be, you know, have to be presented for us to see Nero as an antagonist, as a villain. And they're able to do that in this chapter very, very well. I think this was definitely... Um, a really nice one trick establishment with uh with narrow i mean i guess it's, it's more of like two steps because you have to take uh, the chapter that he was introduced into account but really at, at that point it's just two quick steps in understanding why he's a problem and why he's so bad because before this it just seemed like he was it didn't he didn't seem that bad like we even saw the flashback with uh with ziggy and narrow didn't really seem to be that much of a problem but in this chapter, we see that he's just, he doesn't have any form of, of realistic care for any of the people within his kingdom and his, his empire. He doesn't have any shred of compassion or like their lives in reality. He just sees it as whatever the dice tell him to do, he's going to do because, you know, he's, they've gotten him this far. And I actually didn't know that there was going to be a double chapter this week. I was completely surprised by that. Um, I actually read the chapters backwards, and I read chapter 138 first, and then I realized that 137 just came out, so I went and went through that. I really liked the color page. I thought that was really cool, just because it's, it's different from Mishima's regular style. It's like, what what would this kind of style be? Is this more like pastels? I don't, I don't really know. I like It looks very... Actually, it looks more like he's using a water brush, or, I think, or something. Just my... My memory on, on, on some aspects of, of like wrong. I mean, I, I could easily be wrong. I'm just going on what I remember. Um, and then you like the chapter start. You have Jo May. Jo May's doing her thing, breaking the fourth wall, being the narrator. Even mentioning that we're getting two chapters this week. I actually thought that was pretty neat uh, for her character in general. I mean, Jo May. Jo May is a weird character, uh, just obviously from the fact that she has like a narrator aspect of her role in the story, and she like after this like clearly much is aware that she's in a manga like her first wall breaking is cool but i like i never really expect her to have much of a, an actual role in the series outside of her narration anytime that they go to visit her i'm probably going to be surprised and, and like wondering like what are exactly are they going to be going to Xiao Mei for unless they outright state it beforehand just because again she's a really weird character in the series if not the weirdest just because of the fact, again, the fourth wall breaking and uh, her apparently knowing everything and then just... Uh, the only thing that she doesn't know are fights and how she, uh, you know, bargains for information. She's a weird character, like, across the board. But we have, like, a bunch of robots that are upset over, obviously, the discrimination that's going on between, uh, you know, everything that sure has been putting out. And this bad guy, I, like, I didn't really have anything to say about him, like, initially... He's just like some bad dude with a cigar who's like being a jerk doing his thing. But he has a nice mustache. I didn't even notice that until now. He's got like this crinkle cut mustache. And it actually looks pretty cool. But uh, after that point, what is it? What was the one dude's name? I Iba yeah, Ibaraki or whatever, the, the Pompadour alien. Comes in and shoots this guy. So he like what, like immediately kills him? I I'm wondering about that. Um, but he ends up going, charging these guys down. Shiki just rushes in looking like he's excited just you know flex his powers a little bit they're like shooting bullets at him he's grabbing them throwing them off to the side having no problem here and just laying into these because these these are just fodder these are just random freaking soldiers that uh don't really like they don't have a name they're just they're just nameless henchmen that right now just exist for the cast to end up showing off their skill like shiki's just completely no diffing their bullets throwing all their attacks aside having no problems Rebecca's thing that I was really wondering when she's like saying you'll never hit uh, hit anything Amy like that. I wonder if she's just talking about pinpoint accuracy or if she's. I, I don't think it's implied, so there's no reason for me to think it. But I was wondering if she's like able to shoot their bullets maybe in mid air because maybe if they're like really you know she just they just have bad aim, 
weak gunfire, maybe she could pinpoint their shots and take them out mid, you know, mid movement. And that's not that crazy to think about, considering like characters have been dealing with bullets for a while in Zero, and even in this chapter, they even mention how Mora is completely having no problem cutting and deflecting bullets. So Rebecca, whose whole thing has been emphasized on speed and uh, just her general aim, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be too out there. Like, it, it would just feel kind of crazy for her, I think, just because she's, as been stated, the weakest. She just has the best ether gear out of them. Maybe it'll be something in the future. It, it'll be cool regardless if that happens. But then Wise. Wise's was actually more surprising because he, like, moves what looks like, I don't know, some air conditioning unit and makes some... Um, like, they just look like roadblocks with spikes. And the thing is, like, I, that I didn't really think about initially. Is, like, I was wondering, like, how is that exactly technology? But, I mean, it could still be technology, like, based, but it just, the outside shell is different. Like, say it just has, you know, some form of computer machine aspect to it on the inside. It doesn't mean he can't reset the outside to, you know, be like this, where it's just a brick with some spikes on it. I thought that was just really cool in general. Uh, for Wise. Wise's power is the one that I'm most interested in coming up just because of the fact that he, you know, he's got probably the coolest power out of the main cast. Like, Shiki's is the most flexible in most scenarios. Like, Wise is obviously dependent on having machines and stuff nearby. But I mean, like, just the fact that you're almost always going to have some form of machine nearby is going to be really cool to see just him do his thing at all points in time. Almost at any point in time, rather. Uh, and then there's, like, the, the truck that, that, he ended up making these roadblocks for. I had a kid inside, no one driving. Rebecca just rushes in mid-crash. And that's one of the things I was like, her being able to shoot bullets uh, wouldn't be too too crazy considering that she is speed-based and they're emphasizing on her speed in this scene. Uh, you know, she's in mid, like this, this thing is in mid-crash. Like it's in there. She rushes in, grabs the kid, pulls him out, and then gets back before, uh, before the your truck even hits anything and it does like a it does like a michael bay style like the second it lands after it crashes it just explodes but i think it was designed to do that i'm just guessing um you know it's a weaponized truck i mean the kid's trying to do some suicide mission or something but uh after that point they're they're very upset that this kid is um is being used for the army i'm very curious now of what this kid's role is Considering he had like a uh, like a point in this like he had his own uh, short moment with Rebecca And then he's got like this line drawn in his eye And I don't think Mishima would have him like that if he's not gonna be somebody More significant later and the weird thing about some of the characters that uh, it's gonna be hard to keep in mind is that Because of stuff like the chronophage and time travel in Eden Zero and we know from you know way back in the early parts of the story when it was stated that time is not like, like the time like a linear timeline is not that relevant in the story because time can shift all over the place so as far as you know maybe this kid's gonna at some point run into some scenario where he gets aged up i don't know maybe he's got something more important i was very happy that they saved the little robot kid though they had like he looked like a little uh school boy i just remembering um like, I saw them, and I was remembering the, the, the little merchants from... I, I don't... I'm, I'm sure they're in maybe some other games, but I'm thinking of Legend of Zelda um, Oracle of Seasons. And, and, and you go in that one realm where they're from, and you have these little dudes with the masks on with the hoods. They kind of look like shy guys. I can't remember what they're called off the top of my head. They, like, live around lava and stuff. Somebody's probably going to, you know, tell me what it is in the comments. Um, but... I, I always like those guys, and I, I, that's the first thing I thought of when I saw this dude. And I'm just like, man, I really hope somebody saves this little dude. Pino comes in, comes to talk to him, comes in, you know, gives him a, a re, you know, just a reassurance that, the, that these guys are on their side and they're uh, they're gonna help out. Uh, they're gonna help out the machines in this because like the machines didn't do anything, and Machima's done a really good job at establishing the robots are sentient. The only real difference between a lot of these robots and the humans are. You know flesh and blood versus wiring and uh you know and bolts and electricity and stuff because there have been robots that are just you know the the style of robots you'd expect they're just programmed machines that just do their you know do whatever they're created to and then there's obviously robots that are made fully sentient and 
having, uh, like, what Mishima's been set up here, I think it's been really well following of just seeing how, you know, the, them going to the aid of these machines. Because these guys don't want to die. There's already, obviously, a way on top of that for them to die. If their core is destroyed, they essentially are dead. But then Goodwin coming in, I was actually really happy about. Because, like, him, I've been wondering, like, what exactly is his... Like, what exactly is he going to do? Because he's he's powerful. Like, we knew that he, he's the boss of them. He's this gigantic cat. Dude's like 30 to 40 feet tall. But he comes riding, me, riding in one of those fish camels and then just starts, you know, laying waste to them, just doing physical strength, flipping over cars with just his, uh, his, his general size, his might. He's got, a, you know, a big old greatsword. I was happy about that. I want to know if he's got any ether powers. Either way, I thought that was just cool in general because... I wouldn't have liked it if he sat back and watched. I mean, he's a giant cat dude. Like, he has... I mean, he's also jacked. So, he should be fine mulling down, like, a bunch of, uh... Just, like, mulling these dudes down. All these, like, fodder soldiers being able to show his strength. And then, at the end of the chapter, you see Fabian, you know, one of the, uh... One of the oceans. And he's, like, saying how he didn't go over with Shura. And, you know, Shura ended up killing Saika. Which, again, I still think is, like... A weird thing that um that he did like i understand it but i'm happy to see fabian giving a um or F sorry uh fabiano not fabian uh, giving his input on that because he was not okay with it and i would imagine that his upset over that like he was probably closer uh to saika than you know just like um, maybe being a member of the team or you know just being a dude who talks to a robot maybe they were friends i don't know we don't know exactly if um if his core was destroyed, I would assume so, just because of the fact that he says that, you know, he killed Reverend Saika. But after that point, like, Nero is, like, saying how, um, no matter what, uh, you know, fate has been decided. He's saying that there's, like, nothing that's gonna happen that's going to, um, go away from the guidance that his dice told him. And he's completely fine because victory has already been determined. So I'm guessing that this is, the, that whatever happens is going to happen and then we're going to have to have some rebecca time travel in order to get the situation fixed or maybe she'll see in the future and that will be um the thing that they have to fix at some point so she, her being able to see in the future like maybe if she's like like if mishima does give her time like a, a time sight kind of thing i wonder exactly how it would work if he's going to give her it'd be like a linear you can only see in this one timeline you can't see what how Actually, I think that would be really balanced. If he, like, makes it so that she can see in the future, but she can't see of how changing the future is going to affect. Like, if she wants to, like, say, like, if they go, they're supposed to go right in a timeline and they instead go left, she can't know what's going to happen until they already do it. Or if it's, like, um, kind of like, um, how, uh, Doctor Strange was in, like, the movies where he just saw all these different timelines like maybe it's just like rebecca would see so many it'd be hard for her to pinpoint which is the right one they need or which one is the one for their timeline i don't know but either way like it it's the question of, of how what he's saying is going to get forwarded unless like the main cast is just going to alter stuff coming up in general well you know that that's the big question but Nero. Nero in this chapter like i said like he doesn't see any any of the individuals involved he really just sees as the dice told him, he, you know, what he needs to do. He's going to follow it because that's the, you know, what's led him to victory. He's thinking more about, I, I would assume, the greater picture and his his dominance over his empire rather than the people in it. And it's a complicated scenario in that one. Like, I can really understand because it's like, obviously, like, your people are your people. Like, they're they're in bad spots. And Fabiano, uh, Fabiano says that... Um, I think he says that millions and billions could die. I don't know. He was talking about, like, people are dying, but it's the, um, it's Nero who's saying that he doesn't care how many people die, even if it's millions or billions of people. So, again, he's looking at it more from the standpoint of him and his empire rather than the people, but at the same time, it's like him, uh, him and his empire being victorious is good for the overall status of the people and his kingdom it, it's really weird he's looking at it more from like a from like if you read it on paper rather than obviously taking into the real lives of the people involved so i thought that was a good chapter just from uh i mean the general layout like you got to see like a lot of the characters doing stuff there's that kid there with the like the eye like the line on his eye i'm wondering what exactly is going to be up with him 
and then the stuff with Nero. Nero's stuff was probably my favorite part of this chapter, just because I, I really liked how easily Machine was able to take the whole dice thing from the previous chapter and work it into his why he's a problem why um goodwin and all these guys want to take him down because clearly he's not somebody who cares about his people he cares more about the overall structure of his empire and the if the dice tell him you know x amount of people have to die in order to do that he clearly doesn't care about those that have to be lost it's really the dice told him that he's going with it but anyway other than that, though, uh, comment below. Tell me your thoughts about this chapter and what you think things are, you know, going to be moving forward with uh, with, with the scene and zero. So I'm going to jump on the review for the next chapter and upload it right after this. So look forward to that. I got a couple videos that I got to do today, um, and I wanted to start out with the uh, the Eden Zeros one just because it was a double chapter. I didn't think they would come out until later today, but uh, they, they already translated. So I'm gonna I'm not jumping on those. Uh, Fairy Tale chapter still got coming on today, and then um, I got a couple theories and then just talk videos that I want to do. Anyway, other than that, don't comment below. Thumbs up, do friend the like button, subscribe button, and uh, check out my videos. Other than that, I appreciate it when you are subscribed. Thank you all for listening.